welcome all of you that are part of this, uh, actually the uh, sixth webinar in our series that we started at the first of the year. Um, we're very pleased that today to have uh, Lance uh, Bombay from uh, Iowa State University uh, and the sponsorship of Elanco for this uh, webinar this morning on uh, learning more about heat stress. So uh, it's actually pretty cool here in Fort Atkinson today and, and it's supposed to be cool the rest of this week. But we've had some 90 degree stuff and he'll be back again and it's probably 90 or more some places in the country right now so this topic uh, is always timely and with that I'll let Mike, uh, uh, Mike Hutchins at the University of Illinois introduce our presenter. Well, very good, Steve. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, to be back on the horse dairy. I mean, let's go to our next PowerPoint, Lance. If you can push the next one, please, uh, just to give you a little idea, kind of what's coming down the line here. Uh, next, uh, in July 11th, uh, we will be looking at corn silage, getting it right. We think that's going to be a challenging and fun topic. Get some new concepts, some new research and ideas we'll bring forward. And then August 8th, we'll be one on responsible antibiotic use. Of course, we're all well aware of the somatic cell changes we thought we we're going to see but we don't see we're also aware of some of the challenges coming from FDA looking at the residues from meat animals dairy animals and of course milk production and that will be Dr. Jeff Smith so mark those on the calendars we would certainly welcome you to come there as well Lance let's go to our next PowerPoint and that will be my clue to introduce we're very very excited to have Dr. Lance Baumgart with us here today uh, Steve already indicated he's from Iowa State University he is the Norman Jacobson uh, professor of dairy science. Some of us old people know who Norm Jacobson was, a very prestigious nutritionist at, the uni at, uh, at Iowa State University. Lance got his BS and master's degrees from the University of Minnesota and a PhD from Cornell and then joined the University of Arizona staff uh, back in the fall of, of 2001 as assistant professor was promoted to uh, associate professor in 2007 and then in the spring we're kind of we are excited in the Midwest to have Lance come back to us. He uh, joined uh, the faculty at Iowa State University. He is a prolific writer and co-author, speaks at a number of national and international conferences at this point. And Lance, without any further ado, we'll turn this program over to you. His title is, We're Learning More About Heat Stress. Uh, Dr. Lance Baumgart, welcome to the Hordes Dairyman uh, Seminar Series. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I assume everyone can hear me fine. Um, well, a special thanks to Hordes Dairyman for, for having me. That's very much appreciated, and of course, Steve Lankel for helping sponsor. Also, a big thanks to my co-author, Dr. Rob Rhodes. Rob and I um, have conducted almost all these heat shots experiments together. He's at the University of Arizona, and so he, he and his wife just took a position, took positions at Jimmy Tech University, and he's studying there in July October, or uh, August. Anyway, so let's talk about heat stress. Certainly, it's, it's high on our radar screen last week. We had over 100 degrees in Iowa and Minnesota, so it's um, certainly a, a part of the pun, but a hot topic. So let's make sure we're talking about environmentally induced heat stress rather than fever or pyrexia. The two are very different. The biology of what happens to it when an animal gets uh, environmental induced heat stress is very different than when it has some, some type of infection or some type of inflammation that causes fever. Today we're talking about hyperthermia induced by uh, environmental heat stress. So the THI is a, has been for 40, 50, 60 years now a convenient way of measuring uh, the stressfulness of different environments. And what we have here is it just stands for temperature humidity index, temperature on the, on the uh, y axis, relative humidity on the x axis. And this assumes that animals are in inside of a barn or some type of shade. It doesn't incorporate soil radiation. Hey, Lance, uh, th this is Mike Hutchins. Can you get a little bit closer to your microphone? We're not coming through quite loud enough. Some of our people are having a little trouble picking up on you. Yep. Is that better? Oh, that's much better. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I should just take off from here, you think, Mike? But well, anyway, it, we have environmental temperature on the y-axis and relative humidity on the x-axis. And, of course, this, the THI does not incorporate either solar radiation or, or wind, so it's, it's, it's a nice tool to measure whether or not the environment is stressful, especially when animals are either in a barn or under some type of shade. And for the longest time, for at least 40, 50 years now, we've assumed that THI is 72 is when animals become stressed. And of course, the 72 THI can be reached 
at, a, at 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity. It often can be, also can be reached a PHI of 88 and relative humidity uh, a very low, right? So it's, it's this range of environmental temperatures that we think um, dictates whether or not the animal becomes stressful. So heat stress isn't a global problem. I would argue that almost every area in the globe that has um, dairy nutrition, or dairy, I'm sorry, experiences some episodes of heat stress. And even in Canada, 40% of the Western Canadian summer days have a THI of greater than 72. So if half the days in, in Canada are stressful um, with heat stress, of course, most of America are experiencing at least 50% of the summer of stress. Now, this is a slide that was given to me, our compliments of Bill Batcher and Pete Hansen at the University of Florida. And of course, these are three, four areas, three of them are, that are very well known to have uh, heat stress, Florida, Arizona, and South Africa. And this is conception rates on the y-axis and month of the year on that x-axis. Even in Minnesota, right, we, we see um, pregnancy rates and reproduction indices go down during the summertime. And certainly that wasn't, um, that, was the, that was also the case at Iowa State Dairy last year. Our, our pregnancy rate didn't come back to pre-April levels until middle of December. So the lingering effects that heat stress has on repro well into the fall probably or economically as devastating as, as reduced milk yield. Probably more. Okay, so the THI is an easy way to measure and evaluate heat stress. Okay, and the longest time we thought 72 is when cows become heat stress. This is based upon 60 year old data, primarily out of the University of Missouri, uh, evaluating cows that were producing 25 to 35 pounds of milk per day. Now we think there's at least three different reasons why modern dairy cows would be more heat more prone to heat stress and more susceptible to heat stress than old cows. The first, of course, is milk yield. Uh, milk yield today can be over 100 pounds, 150 pounds per cow per day. And we know that this process of synthesizing milk creates a lot of metabolic heat. Okay, so that, that's the first reason. The second reason is, of course, the animal has to eat more um, just to uh, provide for that increase in milk synthesis. And we know digestion, fermentation, digestion, absorption, assimilation, of nutrients also generates a lot of heat. And the third one is modern dairy cows are much bigger. And we've been selecting for milk yield for the last 100 years or so. We've also been increasing from our, for body size. You know, the primary routes of heat dissipation is this um, surface area to mass ratio. And modern dairy cows have a reduced surface area to mass ratio, and this is um, detrimental to heat dissipation. So there's a variety of reasons why we believe modern dairy cows, it's more susceptible to heat stress. You know, we think of heat stress in the Midwest um, as composed, to, for example, to Arizona. I, I always like to tell a story. I, I came home to visit mom and dad. We, I grew up in southwestern Minnesota. And I left Tucson, Arizona, and Memorial Day weekend in 07. And it was 107 degrees and 5% humidity. So the THI was about 79 to 80. And if landed in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, it was 95 degrees and 70% humidity. So the THI was upper 8. So the summer hadn't, hadn't even officially began yet. And it was more stressful in the Midwest than it was in Arizona. And Minneapolis had 103 degrees for over six hours the other day. And um, so certainly you can get very stressful in the Midwest. So one of the questions we had at Arizona, and this, these experiments were, were led by Dr. Bob Callier, and um, Rob and I were co-authors on the grant and on the papers, but is it time to reevaluate the THI? And essentially the questions we have are, when do modern dairy cows begin to experience heat stress? And that's, we need that answer because dairymen need to know when to initiate cooling, right? When to, when to invest in the cooling, when to turn them on. And the other question we had then is, is it peak daily heat, meaning you know, the, the peak hottest part of the day? Is it average daily THI, meaning a cumulus, accumulation of all 24 hours? Or is it minimum daily THI that's most indicative of heat stress? So we generated some experiments. Um, this, this was presented at the Southwest Nutrition Conference uh, a couple years ago by Liz uh, Zimmerman. So at Arizona, the University of Arizona, we conducted a variety of different experiments evaluating uh, different environments. 
And this, these are, I think, eight different experiments looking at the average daily THI. And so this is the average daily THI on the x-axis and the decrease in milk yield on the y-axis. This is in kilograms per day. So to get this into pounds, multiply these values by 2.2. Okay. So the average THI in the low to mid-60s, we didn't really see any effect on milk yield. But of course, up here at THI of 70, we're already losing almost over six pounds of milk. And remember, 72 is when we thought cows began to be susceptible to heat stress. So clearly, uh, looking at daily average THI, uh, cows are more susceptible to heat stress long before 72. Then we looked at temperature humidity index a daily minimum. What would be the minimum THI to induce uh, heat stress? And again, remember, 72 is when we thought cows start to become heat stress. And we got a THI of back here, 66, is when it really takes off. You see there's really no difference in milk yield up until the mid-60s, and then it just takes off. So um, clearly, from a milk yield standpoint, cows are much more susceptible to heat stress than a THI of 72. And this fits really nice with the University of Wisconsin data, uh, I think Nigel Cook's data, looking at behavioral changes with different THIs. And cows start to stand more, which is a classic response to heat stress when uh, the THI reaches 67. So if you add the behavioral data with this molecule data that Dr. Collier has been generating, it's clear that modern day dairy cows are more susceptible to heat stress um, and that THI is probably around 66 to 67. So in summary from, some, from this part of the talk, uh, high producing cows experience heat stress at a THI of, of around 65 to 68, much lower than the traditional 72. For example, a THI of 65 can be reached 65 degrees, 95 percent humidity. As, milk, as we continue to uh, select cows based upon milk yield, it's likely then that uh, the THI when cows become stressed will continue to decrease. Right? That's just that's just physics. Okay, so now let's talk about how heat stress affects rumen health. And I like this photo because it shows a cow uh, that's panting like a dog. You can see her, her tongue's hanging out and she's drooling. And we'll talk about why both of these contribute to rumen acidosis. So the effects of, of, of heat stress on animal production, including dairy, uh, is quite evident. Of course, with regards to dairy, there's an immediate decrease in milk yield, which the dairyman uh, experiences in the pocketbook. There's long-term effects as well, body condition, acute health problems, and we're going to talk about is rumen acidosis. Uh, obviously, reproduction uh, rates go down, and like we talked about before, this, this reproduction indices don't really bounce back until late fall. And in fact, uh, the effects of the negative effects on repro might outweigh economically at least uh, all the other effects combined. Animals can abort, uh, animals can die. You remember the 2006 June heat wave in California, estimated 40,000 cows died. It's, um, it's a costly issue, and I think you could argue that heat stress, the negative effects of heat stress on animal agriculture probably outweigh all the other negative effects combined. That's a tough argument because we know heat stress causes poor reproduction, causes mastitis, etc. But it's economically devastating. Oh, shoot, I thought I had a different slide there. But the problem with rumen acidosis is, of course, yeah, reduced fiber digestion, uh, laminitis, milk fat depression, etc. Etc. Uh, many farmers report that their cows have sore feet, uh, laminitis, late summer, early fall, and it's probably due to this uh, intermittent bouts of heat stress during the summertime. We'll talk why that is in a second. But this is an old experiment, old but a goodie. It's looking at rumen pH on the y-axis. Of course, a lower number means more acidity uh, conditions. And then cows are put either on a high forage or a high concentrate diet. And then within each diet, cows are either heat stress or they remain in cool, cool neutral conditions. And in both circumstances, cows that are heat stressed have lower rumen pH. Now let's talk about the biology of why this occurs. Rumen acidosis during heat stress uh, originates via at least two main mechanisms. One of this altered respiration, essentially panting. We'll, we'll talk about why this panting uh, reduces the systemic buffering capacity of the cow. But it also has to do with changes in their feed and feeding behavior. Okay. Things that she does and things that we might do to her. For example, one of them is reduced feed intake. 
it's very difficult to give a, a cow luminosidosis if she's a full lumen, especially full lumen of, of fiber. But remember back to your days in college, and we want to induce acidosis um, from an experimental standpoint. The protocol is if you limit feed cows for three or four days, and then you allow them to gorge, right? And then when they, on the fourth day, you allow them to gorge. And what that'll do is that will almost guarantee to induce from an acidosis. Well, that's exactly what happens in the Midwest. Let's think of last weekend when it was 100 degrees for three days, four days. I think it was over 103 degrees in Minneapolis for six hours. So I'm sure cows went off feed, right? I know they did. Um, they go off feed for three, four days. And then Wednesday, do you remember what Wednesday was like? Or Thursday, I can't remember. Thursday was just beautiful, 60 degrees. Well, cows went off feed. Thursday, the weather broke, it was 65 degrees, and they're guaranteed a cow's gorge. And they're guaranteed they also had uh, acidosis. So that's why, from a lumen acidosis standpoint, I think you could argue that Heat stress is harder on the Midwest cows than they are in Arizona, Florida, Texas, and San Joaquin Valley cows because our heat stress is intermittent, intermittent right? Where um, in Arizona, of course, in, in Florida, it gets hot early spring, it stays hot, and guarantee it'll be hot the next day. So they don't get these huge fluctuations in feed intake like they do in the Midwest. And then, of course, because energy intake is going down, uh, a knee-jerk reaction by some nutritionists and vets is, is to increase the concentrate levels in the diet. We, we, want to do, we want to do that with care. They become even better sorters during the summertime. Uh, and, of course, they, they bow to slug feed. So instead of going to the bunk normally 12, 14, 15 times a day, uh, like they do during total neutral conditions, during the heat stress, they'll only get up and eat three, four times a day. And the slug feeding then also contributes to lumen acidosis. We want cows to be feeding the nibblers and consuming feed uh, evenly spread across the day. And because they're uh, eating less, they ruminate less. And because they ruminate less, they make less saliva. Okay? And the saliva that they are making, they're drooling. We want that saliva in the room because it contains viable uh, buffering agents, uh, specifically bicarb. To help you to help buffer that lumen. So I don't want to ask you to remember your regurgitate your biochemistry, but this is what happens during lumen acidosis. You have breaking down of, of fiber, uh, going through the process of glycolysis, pyruvate being converted into these three volatile fatty acids: acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Now, if these three volatile fatty acids build up um, too much, we get the increased then of lactic acid, and hence the name lactic acidosis. Let's now talk about how this panting, uh, this increased respiration rate, contribute to uh, lumen acidosis. A cow, like almost all mammals, require a very strict ratio of 21 bicarb to CO2 in the blood. And this is one of, the, one of the primary buffering capacities in blood. But because the cow is panting, essentially hyperventilating, the levels of CO2 in the blood go down because it's being exhaled in the lung. Now, to maintain this ratio, She's got to dump bicarb in her kidney. Right? This is a problem because the transfer of bicarb, blood bicarb, to saliva is essentially a concentration dependent basis, meaning if the levels of bicarb in blood are have been reduced, the rate at which bicarb is transferred from blood to the saliva is reduced. Right? So again, that's a problem because we want the saliva to be rich in bicarb. So from a lumen acidosis standpoint, uh, heat stress is the, is the perfect storm. It's the perfect recipe because animals are panting. That reduces their blood bicarb. They reduce their feed intake, so they ruminate less. They're panting. They don't have time to ruminate. And that reduces their overall saliva production. Now, the saliva that they are making already contains less bicarb, right, because of the blood transfer to saliva has been reduced. And the saliva they are making, some of it they're wasting as drool. You couple that then with these altered feeding habits, especially gorging, and our, our tendency to throw more grain at the problem. And you add this all together, and it's just a perfect recipe for lumen acidosis. You couldn't, you couldn't plan this any better if you tried. And so I, I, would, I would contend that uh, it, it may pay dividends to pay attention to lumen acidosis. It may pay dividends late summer, early fall through the and sulfate. 
Well, just now let's talk about the metabolism of, of heat stress. And but before we do, I'm just going to ask you to kind of back, reach back in your brain and, and recall some of your you know, biology and metabolism nutrition classes that you took back in college. So nutrient, whether or not nutrients are partitioned towards the synthesis of milk, or they're wasted, or burned, or stored, is in large part determined by the balance between anabolic hormones and catabolic hormones. Okay. The ones I'm going to talk about today are insulin, which is an anabolic hormone, a hormone that favors the synthesis of a tissue, versus glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol. These would be hormones that are responsible for the breaking down of a tissue, that are catabolic in nature. But during heat stress, um, some hormones are reduced, thyroxin, somatotropin, generally considered anabolic, and some, most of them that are increased are catabolic in nature. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, glucagon, and oddly enough, prolactin goes up, which we still don't have a good clue for why that occurs. And the BD and Babcai are kind of characterized these things almost 30 years ago now. So during, um, during well fed situations, when the animals consume the aluminum feeding tank, the GI tract, GIT, is absorbing these nutrients. These nutrients, specifically glucose, then cause the pancreas to secrete insulin. Now, if you've had any starch this morning or today for lunch, uh, you have high levels of insulin. Same thing happens in cows. This insulin then uh, directs these nutrients to be stored as adipose tissue or fat. Okay, that's what this the arrow. Um, glucose to be stored in the liver is, is glycogen, and amino acid to be stored. Excess circulating nutrients then can be utilized for the mammary gland or for growth. Okay. During low levels of insulin, so when the animal is malnourished or on a restricted diet, because you have reduced levels of these uh, nutrients coming in, you have reduced levels of insulin. Because you have reduced levels of insulin, that allows then for adipose tissue to be broken down. So fat would be broken down, back fat would be broken down, blood non acidified fatty acids would go up. The liver starts exporting glucose, you're breaking down the glycogenolysis, the muscles start breaking down the amino acids. From a growth or from a milk yield standpoint, this is good because these circulating nutrients then can be directed towards the mammary gland. You can think of this whole scenario like a transition cow, where the transition cow simply can't eat enough. As a consequence, there's reduced insulin. Because of the reduced insulin, nutrients can be exported from um, stored tissues, muscle and fat, and milk synthesis can be maintained. Okay. So let's talk about the first experiment that uh, Rob and I did. Well, was we used multiplicous cows, 120 days of milk. All of the cows experienced two neutral conditions for one week, 18 degrees Celsius, which I think is uh, low 70s or high 60s. And then all the cows went into heat stress for three weeks. Cyclical heat to try to mimic a typical Arizona day. So 29.4 degrees Celsius, I think it is high 80s, mid 80s, up to uh, over 100 degrees for three weeks. The crew view that the cows are heat stressed. Uh, body temperatures went to 40.5 degrees Celsius, which is 105 degrees. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the respiration rates were doubled. So let me set the stage on this particular graph. We have a week of the experiment on the x-axis and the dry matter intake. Again, this is in kilograms, so multiply these values by 2.2 on the y-axis. Thermal neutral conditions are to the left of this vertical dashed line, and cyclical heat stress is on the right of the dashed line. And just as you predict, when animals become heat stressed, feed intake goes down. And right, feed intake goes down because this is presumably a uh, survival strategy to minimize metabolic heat production. Notice there was, feed intake did come back, okay, there was some affirmation going on in the third week of heat stress, and feed intake was increased. Milk yield, though, its pattern is almost identical to that of heat or feed intake. However, there wasn't any affirmation with heat stress. So this was uh, peculiar to us because everyone has thought um, for a long, long time that reduced animal productivity, whether it's milk or growth or eggs for chicken, whatever, reduced productivity during heat stress is caused by the reduction in feed intake. Well, if the reduction in feed intake is responsible for the reduction in, in productivity, then we would also have anticipated an increase in milk yield during this third week. So that confused us. And um, 
the other the next thing we looked at was we know that these cows uh, are in a stressful situation. And in general, when animals become stressed, when, especially when they lose body weight, blood non serified fatty acids go up. For example, during the transition period, blood NEFAs go up. And that's a that's uh, end product of back fat breakdown. So in this particular experiment, we noticed that NEFAs didn't go up at all. This is really weird because feed intake went down, what, 35%? Animals were losing body weight. We were anticipating that blood NEFAs were going to go up, and it didn't. And um, it's peculiar. So from this very first preliminary experiment, some interesting observations we had. One is that feed intake acclimated to heat stress, uh, but milk yield did not. And to us, this suggested that there was something in addition to reduced feed intake that was responsible for uh, the decrease in milk yield. And in addition, uh, despite the negative energy balance and loss of body weight, reduced feed intake, etc., adipose tissue did not appear to be mobilized. And again, from a metabolism standpoint, we thought this was quite interesting. So this led us to have uh, a couple of questions. And the primary one is, does the decrease in feed intake fully explain the reduced milk yield during heat stress? And essentially what we're asking is, what are the indirect effects of heat mediated by reduced feed intake versus the direct effects of heat? And if we had a better understanding of this question or of this relationship, hopefully we'd have a better understanding of how to alleviate it. So we did some, some experiments to try to get at that question. We, again, we used multiparous hosting cows, and we did a variety of experiments, two of which I'm going to show you today here. The first period, all the cows are in thermal conditions uh, for about 10 days. During period two, then, one half of the cows enter into cyclical heat stress. Again, mimic a very severe heat stress, uh, heat stress that you'd see, for example, in Arizona. The other half of the cows remain in thermal neutral conditions but repair fed, meaning we only allow these two neutral cows to consume the same quantity of feed that the heat stress cows are consuming. And we needed to do this to eliminate the confounding effects of this summer feed. I'll explain more in a second. And then we did a variety of different things to get an idea, a better understanding of what's going on with post-absorptive metabolism. And I'll explain all these when I get to the data. So this is driving intake on the y-axis. And again, this is in kilos. So multiply these values by 2.28 pounds. Day of the experiment on the x-axis. Heat stress cows are in the dashed line. And the parafed cows are in the solid line. And remember, these parafed cows are in thermal neutral conditions, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat stress cows are experiencing cyclic heat stress. So of course, when the, when the cows become heat stress, feed intake goes down. And then by design, the parafed cows feed intake mirrors that of the heat stress cows. Okay, so all the data we're about to show has nothing to do with dissimilar feed intake. There's about 30% reduction in, in, in feed intake. Milk yield on the y-axis, of course, the heat stress cows, there's a consistent decrease in milk yield for about seven days, and then it, it plateaus off. And of course, the parafed cows also have an immediate reduction in milk yield, of about five kilos, 12 pounds, but then it plateaus. And we anticipate this plateauing because they're probably breaking down back fat or adipose tissue to support milk yield. And that's, I'll show you in a second exactly what happened. But now we know that all this area, the area between the pear fed cows and the heat stress cows, has nothing to do with reduced feed intake because both of these animals are on the same plane of nutrition. So by doing some simple math, we know that the reduction in feed intake explains about 50% of the reduced milk yield. And we've done this experiment four or five times, and it's incredibly um, repeatable. So again, going back to this, this cow here, we anticipate that she breaks down adipose tissue or her back fat to support milk yield. The pair fed cows and the heat stress cows, this is, this is energy balance or calculated energy balance on the y-axis. And of course, they both go into negative energy balance of about negative five, negative six mega cows per day. And this assumes an increased maintenance cost in the heat stress cow. So they should both be losing body weight. And in fact, that's what, well, that's what occurs. The loss of body weight in heat stress in the perfect cows is approximately 90 to 100 pounds. This is in kilos. So in 7 to 10 days, they're losing almost 100 pounds of body weight. And again, we anticipate that these cows, both of these cows are breaking up adipose tissue, 
that would probably explain the increase, decrease in, the, in um, body weight. The parafed cows certainly are, right? Parafed cows break down adipose tissue or back fat to support milk yield, uh, which is demonstrated here by the increase in blood non certified fatty acid levels. The heat stress cows do not. So that begs the question what are the heat stress cows burning for energy? It certainly doesn't appear as if they're breaking down their back fat. So this is basal MIFAs, and what we looked at then is the MIFA response to an adjuvermic signal. Essentially, this, the, um, the sensitivity to signals, for example, epinephrine, that cause breakdown of adipose tissue. This is pretty long with both animals. Most groups of animals are in thermal neutral algorithmic conditions. This is pretty acute. Just like you predict, the parafed cows have a much higher MIFA response. So they're much more sensitive to lipolytic signals, or the signals that cause the breakdown of back fat. But the huge chest cows do not become sensitive. So that's certainly um, coupling that information leads us to believe that the heat adipose tissue is becoming less sensitive to signals that cause breakdown of back fat. Circulating the insulin levels always go up when an animal eats, except for during heat stress, where when the animals are going down in feed intake, circulating the insulin levels go up. This is a really strange phenomenon, and we think it's part of the big problem with heat stress cows. But for some odd reason, heat stress cows have increased blood insulin levels. So there's only so many fuels that the animal has access to. One of them is, of course, amount of fatty acids. So that would be the primary one. But feed intake is decreased, so presumably acid contribution is also decreased. They certainly do not appear to be breaking on adipose tissue. In the burning of amino acids, the efficiency is very low, so meaning heat production is very high. So that doesn't make sense. So by the process of elimination, we, we assume that glucose is, is becoming uh, a favorite fuel during heat stress. This is a problem because milk yield uh, is primarily determined by lactose synthesis, and the glucose is the precursor to lactose. We'll talk about that in a second. So to get at that particular hypothesis, we did some glucose tolerance tests. And sure enough, uh, like we hypothesized, heat stress cows dispose of blood glucose levels quicker following the glucose tolerance test than the parafed cow. Okay? And then when we take a look at the glucose response to that same epinephrine challenge, both the parafed and the heat stress cows have an increased response compared to parade one, and there was no insult in the There are significant differences between the two. But key, there is no difference between the parafed and heat stress cows. And this indicates to us that the liver remains sensitive to adrenergic stimulation during heat stress, implying, of course, then that uh, the glucose is a favorite fuel, and the heat stress cow needs to have access to glucose during heat stress. Oops. So when we did the math on lactose yield, we, we know that the heat stress cows are secreting about 400 grams less milk lactose per day than the parafed food and nutrient control. That's would be equivalent to then about the same quantity of glucose because glucose is the precursor to lactose. So that's about a pound per day. That's 154 grams in a pound. What's going on? The question then became to us is, is the liver making 400 grams less glucose per day? So is, is it a liver problem? Or are other tissues, non-memory tissues, burning, utilizing uh, about 400 grams more of glucose per day? That was the question. So we implemented, uh, we collaborated with uh, Matt Waldron at the University of Missouri, looking at overall glucose production using uh, stable isotopes. And what we determined was that both the parafed and the heat stress cows have a reduction in the ability to make glucose. But the take home message here is that there was no difference between the parafed and the heat stress cows, meaning heat stress cow is making just as much glucose as the parafed cow. So this implies then that the liver is functioning just fine and that other tissues, other mammary tissues, other than mammary, are utilizing about 400 grams more glucose per day. That's a problem. Right? So then to really get at this insulin sensitivity, we did the gold standard for uh, insulin sensitivity, which is a hyperinsulinic reduction in the clamp. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But essentially, we were infusing uh, different types of glucose and insulin at the same time. And during period one, uh, when both animals were in some neutral abdominal conditions, there was no difference between the rate of glucose infusion over basic glucose. But during period two, 
periods with peak stress cows having an increased uh, ratio of glucose infusion over blood glucose. And this implies, of course, that the peak stress cows are increasing their sensitivity to insulin. So from a dairy standpoint, we know reduced feed intake decreases milk yield by about 50. Reduced feed intake explains 50% of the reduction in milk yield. Peak stress cows have increased insulin action. We know this because there's decrease in blood mucus and increase in glucose disposal. The bottom line is that heat stress cows require extra energy. Well, that's nothing new. Our, our great grandfathers knew that heat stress cows require extra energy. What is novel about this research is that the, is the energy is glucose. We need glucose. So I'm going to use this um, cartoon that we put together to help illustrate some of our data. One is, of course, that the animals are eating less. So because they're eating less, it makes less propionate. Propionate has three carbons. Propionate is converted in the liver to glucose. Right? Glucose then, because it's not making as much glucose as it wants, um, the low levels of glucose stimulates low levels of insulin. Because there's low levels of insulin, the lack of insulin allows adipose tissue or back fat to be broken down. That's why blood methyl levels are higher during the transition period. Methyl levels then, methyl can be burned for energy by the muscle, it can be utilized by the man then to make milk fat, and it can be converted in the liver to make heat from it. Now, of course, this problem can get out of hand if too much adipose tissue or back fat is broken down, the liver fills up with fat, get fat the liver, it becomes ketotic, etc. But all cows do this to some extent in the transition period. And what this does is it spares glucose. Because now the muscle has, a, a, um, has options. She can burn NEPAs for energy. She can burn ketones for energy. And she can burn raw fatty acids for energy. This whole process then spares glucose. So glucose can be utilized by the mammary gland to make lactose. And then lactose synthesis drives milk yield. Rob and I have been referring to this as metabolic flexibility because she has less insulin levels. Now let's compare her to the heat stress cow. The heat stress cow also has reduced levels of pork, uh, feed intake, so she also has reduced propionate levels coming out of the rumen. She makes less glucose, but the difference is that as low levels of glucose stimulate more insulin release than what it should. As higher levels of insulin prevent her from breaking down back fat. If she can't break down back fat, she doesn't have NEPAs or ketones as options for energy. She, she can't induce any glucose sparing mechanisms, and as a consequence, glucose be utilized, it has to be utilized for energy by the muscle. I didn't show you any blood urea nitrogen level data, but we know blood urea and milk urea nitrogen levels go way up in the summertime. So these amino acids come out of the muscle for the, for the carbon to make more glucose. And as a byproduct of that, you get increased levels of blood urea nitrogen. The bottom line is, She's inflexible. She's inflexible because she doesn't have NEFAs or ketones to burn. As a consequence, glucose then now becomes a favorite fuel during heat stress. It's all because the pancreas makes more insulin than what it should. So one of the things that we've been looking at, uh, we looked at momentum. Momentum increases women propionate production. We looked at BST, partition nutrients. That just, uh, Bob Collier, Todd Billy, and uh, Rob Woods and I have been looking at nice. This is looking at glucose production. And from what I know, from what I'm familiar with, I think this is the very first time anyone's looked at uh, glucose production in lactating dairy cows fed movements. And the beef people, of course, have known this for 30, 40 years. But control cows, momentum fed cows, when cows are fed movements, and there's an increase in overall glucose production, especially when you put it on a program of drive energy basis. Milk yield, this is with BST. This is thermometric conditions, this is heat stress conditions, this is heat stress conditions with BSD. And when animals are getting BSD, even if they're severely uh, heat stress or parafed or underfed, BSD increases milk yield. Okay. So BSD remains as effective during severe heat stress as it does during uh, thermometric conditions. Daily metabolites, glucose, both of them become hypoglycemic. Um, Again, the, the parafed cow breaks on adipose tissue, uh, especially for the heat stress cow. You give the shot of Posilac, it increases the sensitivity of the electrolytic signal, so there's even more meat is there. Uh, and also allows the heat stress cow oops, uh, to, to break down some adipose tissue. And then what that does then, uh, because there's an increase in, in adipose tissue or NEFAs, it allows plasma and levels to go down. So this is key, I think, because 
um, plasma or nitrogen levels, uh, one is costly from an energetic standpoint, especially from a reproductive standpoint. You give that shot of POSLAC and um, plasma or nitrogen levels are returned to normal levels. Uh, Dr. Collier and Todd Milby looked at vaginal temperatures. This is a commercial trial when animals were fed niacin. Niacin, what that does is vasodilate. So the thought process is when animals are on niacin, there'd be an increase in vasodilation, you know, which would allow animals to um, allow animals to dissipate more heat. You know, when animals are fed niacin, there is a small but significant increase, or I'm sorry, decrease in rectal temperatures. Now, whether or not uh, 38.65 versus 38.52, that difference parlays into improved reproduction and production, I think remains to be seen, but certainly nicely can be utilized to reduce body temperature. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because these are mostly theories on, on why these changes would occur. The first one is um, metabolic heat production. And if you needed 100 k of energy off the cow did, she could get that, of course, from burning glucose, or she could get it by burning fat. Of course, there's more energy in fat, but at the end of the day, she would generate 49.1 kcals of metabolic heat going this particular route versus 42.75 kcals going this route, which is 13% less going this route. So it could be a survival strategy where the animal just simply says, I don't want to make any more metabolic heat. I'm going to burn a fuel uh, that allows me to, to generate less heat. The other one is, is uh, mitobio, or, I'm sorry, mitochondria dysfunction. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but long story short, uh, we've generated data, especially Dr. Rose has generated data, indicating that the, the mitochondria becomes dysfunctional. If it becomes dysfunctional, uh, glucose then, or carbon and glucose, can't enter the TCA cycle, and that's a problem. So in summary, I know it's uh, 12.42 now. In summary, I think uh, from a nutrition standpoint, you want to make, concentrate on maintaining a healthy lumen pH. So you know, throwing grain at the problem during the summertime probably isn't the best strategy. Heat stress markedly alters uh, metabolism that's independent of reduced nutrient intake. It's in large part can be explained by reduced insulin action. If you want to maximize glucose synthesis, should improve both cow welfare and production. Uh, dietary management strategies that we've evaluated, ionophores, niacin, DST, these are all uh, high quality strategies. Um, whether or not they pencil, they pay out, I think you need to consult with your nutritionist. There's a variety of people I need to thank that helped funded the experiments, uh, the federal government, a variety of feed industries, uh, companies that helped pay for the experiments, and of course a variety of uh, students and collaborators that helped conduct the experiments and bounce ideas off of it. I'd be glad to ask questions. I see some um, I see some questions being coming in. I'll answer them in a second. And I'd like to thank Iowa State University, specifically the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, uh, for all their help. And uh, special thanks to Link for helping sponsor the webinar. Well, very good, Lance. Uh, that's uh, a fast tour through uh, some. You got a problem? Jim is looking at me. We're okay. I can hear you now. Okay, we had a we were uh, we had a little problem here. Uh, I was muted, I guess, at this stage of the game. Lens, thanks very much for for that presentation here. We'll have some questions coming in here as well. We certainly want to thank Elanco for uh, sponsoring the, the webinar here today, as far as that goes as well. Uh, let me ask the two questions I've got on this end here, as we see more of them pop up as we go along here. Lance, can I take and add together the temperature and humidity in terms of Fahrenheit and divide by two to get a rough idea what the THI is, or is that uh, cheating too much? In other words, if the humidity was 80% and the temperature was 90, then the THI using this swag would be 85, which would really be quite, which would affect your, uh, your number. Can I do that? So... One more time, Mike. You take the you take the humidity. Humidity plus the temperature in Fahrenheit, and divide by two, and yep. say because I may not have this handy dandy chart, or I'm yep. uh, it's it's eleven o'clock and I'm in Central Illinois, and uh, and I, I know those two numbers because I got the radio on. It's pretty close, Mike. Let's just use eighty for example. Eighty and eighty. If you do eighty and eighty, that's one sixty divided by two against eighty. So um, the THI would be seventy seven versus eighty. So you get pretty close. For a rough estimate, I think it's it would be okay. Okay, very yep. good. It's pretty close. 
These, the, these, the question, the, the other question to ask, and that is on niacin, what level of niacin were you looking at when you, at the end of your presentation here today, and what was the form of that niacin? Was that a, a, a raw niacin, a room-protected niacin? That was a room-protected niacin um, made by Balkim, and, boy, I think it was six grams per, six or nine grams per day. Now, that's quite a bit different of a dose than what would be required to reduce adipose tissue breakdown, for example, or cause lipolysis. So there's, it's, it's very dose dependent on whether or not it causes vasodilation or it causes some type of uh, lipolytic response. So I get asked that often. Um, they're very different. So we were using, I think, six grams per day or nine grams per day of a rumor protected product. Okay, and help, help clarify that a comment again as far as it's shutting down the lipolysis. Uh, okay. you're, there's some, there's some data out of Wisconsin, Wisconsin um, that demonstrates that it decreases lip, lipolysis. I, I think that's um, Dr. Grummer's data. Well, I think that dose is very different than the dose that we're, we're evaluating in, in vasodilation. Okay, so basically you're looking at the whole vasodilation. You're not looking at any modifier effect at this part on the cow. That's correct. We weren't, we got, the dose we're using I don't think would have a large impact on metabolism. It's more of a vasodilation objective. Okay. Uh, Lance, we have an, another question here, and I read them because you've seen them. We'll just come down the ones you have in front of you, but people can't, and that is, what facilities were being used in your studies that you performed there at Arizona? Those were uh, environmental chambers, so we could hold uh, 12 animals in those environmental chambers at one time, and we can control all aspects of the environment except the wind, but uh, we could control solar radiation, temperature, and humidity. Yeah, so okay. they're, they're climate chambers. They're, they're you know... Um, so you can just die... Zone. You can just dial those numbers. So you, when you numbers you had there, they were real. There was nothing environmentally uh, outside. You you actually control that inside these these individual cow chambers. That's correct. So the repeatability of those experiments is quite high compared to a commercial trial where you're just at Mother Nature's mercy, right? Uh, Stefan has another question here. We already an you already answered the first part on the grams per cow per day. Is it better for the to use rumen protected sources? Uh, rather than the, the un, unprotected or raw niacin? Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm certainly not the expert when it comes to niacin metabolism, but, I, yeah, I think if you don't if you don't protect it, that niacin will probably be metabolized in the room. So I, I think you need to get some type of technology to get it past the room. Yeah, it seems to me, Lance, someplace we read that uh, the room protected is maybe six to eight times biologically more effective than, than the raw stuff due, due to rumen uh, breakdown. I think that came from Oregon, from Patrick French's group or, or something like that. I think you're right, Mike. I, I remember something like reading about that too. Roberto asks, what would be the ideal dose of rumenzin for adult cow during heat stress? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. I think um, we were evaluating 400 milligrams per head per day. And certainly, 400 milligrams was effective at increasing glucose production. Um, but you know, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, what would be the best dose during heat stress? Yeah, Herberto, we're we're seeing here in the Midwest numbers all the way from 200 to 500 uh, milligrams per cow per day. But that's being driven pretty much by cow response and performance response as far from that aspect there. So there, it's a great question. Sounds like you need more research dollars, Lance, to answer yeah. that question at <laughs> exactly. this point. Can you put our, our, our sponsorship slide, slide back up here? If we don't, if we, it's kind of like the radio program. If we don't pay our bills, we uh, we we we'll be Get cut, off, get cut off the air, and we certainly don't want Elanco to uh, cut us off as far as that goes. Okay, um, inter a little different <laughs> answer here from a, uh, one of our foreign listeners. I would like to know what uh, his, his, his opinion, Lance, is about the effects that could have on a cold stress on dairy cattle, especially in areas of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, effects of cold stress on dairy cattle. Lance, you're on your own on that one. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And uh, from a metabolism standpoint, the exact opposite happens. That also gives us some confidence that what we're measuring is, is real because during cold stress, 
the animal's NEFA levels go up. So they want to rely on adipose tissue for oxidation during cold stress. So it's exactly the opposite as what happens during heat stress. And um, I think um, it also gives us hope <coughs> that what we're measuring is, is real. Okay. I'm not sure what, you know, other than that, I'm not sure what the question really is uh, about. Uh, another question from Steve. He asks, uh, in your studies, did you have enough cows to track the reproductive effects? No. Um, not in our small um, experiments that we did at the, at the university. I think uh, Todd Bilby and Bob Collier have been looking at some reproductive effects in those commercial trials. But I don't have that data. Uh, and the commercial trials were nice in those fed. Maybe another question there related, and that is uh, the 65, 68. That's the new. Uh, that's the that's the new 72, is it not? In other words, uh, that's when our dairy farmers, uh, well, when it gets to be 65, is that when they pull the trigger? I think so. Yep. Yeah, I think I think it's clear now, uh, based upon Bob Collier's experiments, that the modern dairy cow is more successful in heat stress than 72, and it's probably that 65, 68. So turn them on. Mike, <clears throat> Mike and Lance on that. Uh, point we did have uh, a, the new version of the heat stress chart on uh, in our April 25 uh, issue this year. Uh, so those that would like to see the numbers right in front of them, uh, they could refer to that uh, on page 281 of our April 25 issue this year. Excellent, thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. In a related question, Lance, um, when the temperatures start cooling down at 8 or 9 o'clock at night and it's dark, how long do the cows need? Is there a time lag? In other words, uh, from the time we get below 65, we look, when we look at the chart, to when we should stop, our, turn off our waters and our fans? Mm. That's a good question as well. I guess if I had my druthers, we would be cooling cows before it got to be 65 to try to get in front of it. Right, to try to get ahead of it. Um, and the same thing that goes, we, we know a lot of dairymen shut off those fans and coolers at night, but if, if those cows are so big, and there's so much mass to them, it takes them a long time to cool down. So, you know, if, if getting rid of water isn't an issue and money isn't an issue, I would say keep those coolers going, uh, even if it's below 65. Okay. Very good. Another question from uh, Stefan, and that is, what about essential oils? And he lists a couple examples, uh, yeah. cinnamon, uh, could be garlic, uh, and things like that, to enhance uh, propionate production. Yep, uh, that's a good question. And uh, I think you know, anything you can do to increase rumen propionate production, do it safely. That's the key. I, mean, I just don't think you want to throw a bunch of corn at, at the problem. Um, so it, if there's a product that has, you know, very demonstrated, consistent effect at increasing movement of propionate, I think that's a good idea. Susan asked the question, what other supplement can be offered to your cows since this year we came out of May and stepped right into August weather? And I'm not sure where Susan is, but I could think of a lot of places that happened. And we've had 95 degree days for the last two to five weeks. Yeah, it's, I get asked that question often, Susan. Um, you know, the, the primary thing, which I didn't talk about yet, the um, primary thing to help reduce the negative effects of heat stress is from a management standpoint. Heat shade, heat stress abatement strategies. And I know Lenko has a, has a um, three ring binder on the heat, of, heat stress abatement strategies, meaning shade, uh, where, to, where, to, where to invest into uh, evaporative cooling, how much water per nozzle, how far off the cow's back, etc. All those things are the things I would uh, start out with first. Now, once you've invested in the um, heat stress abatement strategy, the physical heat stress abatement strategy, then I would look at nutrition and, and nutrition strategies. And unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of options. I mean, we have um, you know, one of the things you hear people talk about is reducing the fiber content, increasing the grain, which I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I think Romensen's good idea or anything that can help improve um, propionate production is, is a good idea. You know, direct fed microbials and, and these products, if, if there's a product that consistently increases uh, rumen pH and helps maintain feed intake, I think is a great idea. 
the inconsistencies in the literature regarding those are of interest, but um, you know, I know there are some products that do a nice job of helping maintain room pH. I think those are paid dividends. Lance, uh, often the uh, question of feeding frequency, uh, especially yeah. during warm weather, comes up. Uh, based on your your data and observations, uh, what what are you seeing, uh, and would you recommend for people as far as their, uh, especially their higher uh, groups of milking cows, their higher yeah. production? That's good. Yeah, I mean, our great comments. Too. When it's it's going to be hard to get a cow to get up to eat at three o'clock in the afternoon when it's 103 degrees. So, uh, you know, if we, I hear people talk about feeding late at night, early in the morning. When it's relatively cool outside, um, those are all things I think that make sense to people. It inherently makes sense. I think you would want to avoid working cattle, for example, in the middle of the day. Um, try to avoid feed them, feeding them in the middle of the day. I think you maybe try to avoid vaccinations during the middle of the day. If they're already peak day, they're all they're going to be awfully stressed. So anything you can do to help minimize that um, is a good idea from a management practice standpoint and also from a feeding standpoint. Lance, I have another question that's uh, a little uh, different here. Uh, we can step outside and, and we say, well, it's humid today or it's, uh, the air feels better today. Um, but uh, we really probably ought to have some sort of a, a humidistat or something uh, in our barns or around our barns to give us a humidity level. Uh, do you have, and, and a lot of people now have indoor outdoor thermometers that have uh, humidity Mm -hmm. uh, readings as well, but do you have any idea how accurate those are? Are those pretty good guidelines? Well, great question, Steve. And unfortunately, I'm not able to really answer those questions. But uh, I think it would be a great idea for dairymen to have those temperature humidity um, gadgets in their barn that it just automatically, you know, calculates the THI for you, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and help dairymen make decisions on when to cool cows, when to start cooling cows. As for the accuracy. I apologize. I just don't have yeah. a good feel for which ones are the best. Yeah, they were certainly not expensive these days, and uh, might be a pretty good investment. Yeah, I agree. We have another question over here um, on the metabolic fuels. Uh, we saw amino acids uh, in one of your, in a couple of your power, uh, very attractive PowerPoints, by the way. Could I increase rumen undegraded protein in the diet? And assuming cost is not a factor, it would be, of course. But could I uh, could I get more uh, fuel for my cow by uh, going to adding some heat to treated soya or something like that? I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, we as an industry. Do not have any idea what's going on with protein requirements during heat stress. You know, it sounds strange, but uh, I, you could argue, you know, over here, which ones it could go up, it could go down. I and mean, we, we already know that blood urea nitrogen and milk urea nitrogen levels are very high during the summertime. That's exactly what happens in our heat stress experiment. Um, and it, it costs energy. And if it costs energy to get rid of excess amino acids, that means it generates heat. And uh, so, unfortunately, and I get asked this question all the time. We as an industry need more information in order to make better decisions on, on protein levels during the summertime. And I, I know that's a horrible. I'm, I'm punting on the answer, but there, we just don't have a good feel for it. Another question uh, related uh, on DCAD. Does that do a buffer effect in the rumen, or is that going to stimulate dry matter intake? And where do you see the positive DCAD role in terms of rumen and metabolic modifiers? Yep, good question. Um, so, I, I think I've, I've only read a couple papers uh, in JDS that have specifically evaluated different DCAD levels. And I think it's important to maintain a healthy DCAD level during heat stress that uh, plus 20 to plus 30, maybe go a little bit higher. Uh, but I haven't seen much research to, to support going you know, to 40 or any higher than that. So, I think it's important to help maintain that healthy room or that uh, DCAD level during heat stress. Lance, this is Steve. I, we're kind of getting at the, to the end of our hour here, and certainly people can stay with us if uh, their schedules permit. Uh, but uh, before uh, too many uh, move on to other things during for their day, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much uh, for your presentation, uh, for being part of our webinar series, and of course to uh, Elanco also for their, uh, their sponsorship, which is greatly appreciated. And uh, if there are some more questions, uh, people can stay on and join in if, if they wish. Uh, Mike? I appreciate the opportunity. 
Yeah, there's one more question we can uh, come up with here, and uh, that has to do with the, the fat. Uh, uh, do you have any feeling, of, and that's another fuel, it looks like, since the NEFAs aren't being mobilized, should I put some dietary fat in there, or metabolically, what's going to happen if I add some tallow, for example? That's a great question. And, you know, feeding additional fat in the summertime has been a long-held uh, dogma because, of course, the advantage of feeding fat in the summertime is that the, the heat increment of feeding, specifically the heat input, heat increment of fermentation of the rumen is much less than, of course, fiber and, uh, and grain. Um, so actually, I, 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 I challenge this idea at the Four State Nutrition Conference this year, whether or not additional fat feeding is um, makes sense. And it certainly makes sense from a theoretical standpoint. We found all the papers in the literature that specifically evaluated that. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. We, about half the experiments still benefit on the milk production standpoint. None of the experiments showed an improvement in body temperature indices. But, you know, I think uh, it, it gives you some flexibility from a nutrition standpoint. Um, if feeding takes going down 10%. How do I maximize my nutrient intake? Fat allows you to do that. Um, so I think, you know, there's nothing to suggest that feeding additional fat is um, doesn't work. I think in large part depends upon what happens to that fat once it's absorbed, if it's stored, if it turned into milk fat, or etc. But I think feeding additional fat is still probably a good strategy during the summertime. And Lance, we have one final question. I think we'll wrap it up then and turn it back to Steve. And it says, what about Aspergillus ariza? Does it uh, really reduce uh, body temperature by Stefan? Yeah, the, so there are some experiments back at the University of Arizona back in the 80s um, that were conducted evaluating AO. And I think there were some pretty um, good results coming out of there showing that it was effective during the summertime. on that those different experiments, but um, I haven't seen much I haven't seen much research out with AO and during heat stress in the last fifteen years, but I, I haven't been following that literature closely. But um, I'm not sure what the biology of that would be and why it would, but I, I, I do remember reading some papers out of Arizona um, long before I got there that, that showed a, a beneficial effect of AO during heat stress. Very good. Well, Steve, we'll turn it back to you. I think we've got all our questions. It's past 1 o'clock. Uh, any uh, closing comments uh, you well, want to add other than our thanks to Lance? And uh, always an honor to be on the Hordes uh, webinar series. And a personal thanks to Atlantico for their support as well. I want to uh, uh, second that, Mike. Thanks to you, Lance. Good job. And uh, also Atlantico. And I want to call our attention to the next uh, webinar, which will be July 11th, uh, second Monday of each month uh, uh, regularly. The, uh, Mike Hutchins is going to be our presenter. We're looking forward to that. Mike, uh, his topic will be corn silage, getting it right, and it's going to be brought to us by the Biotel Forage Inoculant uh, uh, people. And also in August, we're going to have uh, Jeff Smith, Dr. Jeff Smith from North Carolina State, talk about responsible antibiotic use, and that's really a, a topic that's hot and heating up just, <laughs> just like the weather is. One final reminder that uh, webinars, uh, this one and past ones, will be available uh, on our website. It'll be a few days before this one is posted, but uh, feel free to go to our Ford Airman website, click on webinars, and see the webinar archives. You're welcome to those, of course. Uh, uh, we're glad to have you make use of those. So with that, thanks to everybody. Uh, we appreciate your participation, and uh, we look forward to having you join us uh, on future webinars. Hey, Steve, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always an honor to be affiliated with Horns Dreamer. Well, thank you, Lance. Glad to have you along.